Hi, I'm Mr. White Keys, and this is the lecture series, Music and the Mind, an investigation into the sound of music and how it moves us. Now, this is a nine-part series. We're going to start with part one, musical tones. So let's talk about this a bit. Now, having spent my young life preparing for a career as a concert pianist, and having spent several years as an engineer in aerospace with a graduate education in engineering statistics, I've encountered the topic of acoustics and the application of the harmonic series to acoustics in multidisciplinary contexts. This has led me to an insatiable curiosity regarding how music impacts our emotions so directly and deeply and why. So follow me on my journey down the rabbit hole. Let's see how deep it goes. So I started this project in search of answers to a number of questions I had as I tried to put together the pieces of this giant puzzle. This puzzle is a fantastic marriage of music, engineering, physics, and mathematics, which are my greatest passions. For example, how and why does music affect us? How can a string fixed at both ends vibrate at an infinite number of frequencies simultaneously? How is that even possible? What's the difference between noise and music, harmony and dissonance? Are these subjective? Why is it both mathematically and physically impossible to tune a piano? Doesn't that sound crazy? And what is inharmonicity? Where did our diatonic scale and the circle of fifths come from? What is psychoacoustics? What do tonotopicity and electromotility have to do with how we hear sounds and music? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, why do certain harmonies and sounds make us feel happy while other sounds make us feel sad? Is this effect of music on the mind universal? And if so, why? Now, when we encounter something like this, we call these substantive universals, and we're gonna look for these along our journey. Albert Einstein revealed the effect of music on his life when he said, if I were not a physicist, I would probably be a musician. I often think in music. I live my daydreams in music. I see my life in terms of music. And Plato hinted at the power of music when he said, music gives a soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and life to everything. So let's embark on our journey to answer the following questions. How and why does music affect us? What's the difference between noise and music, harmony and dissonance? Why do certain sounds make us feel happy and others make us feel sad? Is this effect universal? Where did our diatonic scale and the circle of fifths come from? Leonard Bernstein, in his six-part lecture, The Unanswered Question at Harvard University, 1972 to 1973, said, the best way to know a thing is in the context of another discipline. And so we're going to take a holistic view at this topic, how music impacts the mind and the emotions. How does it affect us? We're going to look at it through the lens of mathematics. We'll look at it through the lens of physics. We'll look at it through the lens of psychology. We'll look at it uh, from a number of different perspectives, including diving into the middle ear and the inner ear and how those things work and diving into how the electrical impulses are produced that travel to the brain. We'll certainly look at the harmonic series. So there are a number of different disciplines that we'll be using to uh, attack this subject. My grandfather on my mother's side, Richard E. Townsend, conducted the U.S. Navy Band for four presidents and conducted the National Philharmonic Orchestra. His name is, in fact, engraved on the stage at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. My mother told me stories of when Leonard Bernstein was an occasional dinner guest when she was growing up, so that explains why we had such strict table manners as I was growing up. Now this is kind of a roadmap. You are here, and where are we going? 
So I call this the critical chain, music to mind. There are nine links in that chain. The first one we're obviously going to talk about is link one, musical tones. Energy of a periodic nature in vibratory motion emitted from regularly constituted bodies with consistent structure. We'll dive into what that means in a moment. But in the upcoming videos, we'll talk about link two, overtones, where we explore the harmonic series in detail. And after that, we'll look at link three, musical notes, how the harmonic series in nature forms the foundation of everything we understand and feel about music. After that, we'll look at link four, sound waves. These are longitudinal sound pressure waves that allow music to reach our ears. And after that, we'll look at link five, mechanical waves, which describes the transduction of longitudinal sound waves to sinusoidal mechanical movements within the inner ear. Then we'll explore link six, tonotopicity, deconstructing complex sound waves into an array of its component frequencies by spreading them out for analysis over time and space in the 33 millimeters of the basilar membrane within the cochlea. Then we'll look at link seven, electrical waves, the transduction of sinusoidal mechanical movements into electrical current. Next is link eight, place and temporal coding of frequencies, the transduction of electrical current into place and temporal coding of frequency specific neurotransmitters. And finally, we'll end our journey at link nine, the brain, interpretation by the brain of audio signals from cranial nerve eight, including the phenomena of psychoacoustics. So let's talk about musical tones and how things in nature vibrate to produce sounds. This is the genesis of our journey. Uh, we can't talk about musical tones until we're hearing one. And let's define what is a musical tone? What is noise? And how do we differentiate that? Hence, we shall start our journey. So how do we distinguish between noise and the musical tone? Well, if a vibrating body is irregularly constituted, it will emit irregular sound waves, which we hear as noise rather than musical tones. What we hear is a non-repeating sound wave or a sound wave that is not periodic in nature. We hear this as noise with no defined pitch. One example might be the thud of a sack of flour hitting the ground or the thump of a bass drum. On the other hand, if a vibrating body is regularly constituted and is of consistent structure, it will emit regular sound waves of a periodic nature and we will hear them as a musical tone. It produces energy and vibratory motion, which results in repeating evenly spaced sound waves, which we perceive as a well-defined pitch. Now we'll talk in more detail about sound waves when we get to link four of sound waves. Now let's get a frame of reference. What are we talking about here? We use the piano as a frame of reference. The lowest note on the piano is an A, and an A vibrates at 27 and a half times per second. We call this 27.5 hertz. Hertz means vibrations per second. We'll talk about hertz through the rest of this course. We'll also talk about kilohertz, which is a thousand vibrations per second. The highest note on a piano is 4,186 hertz. We can also express this as 4.186 kilohertz. Middle C on the piano is 256 hertz. And if we map this out as a sine wave using spectral analysis, we would measure about 3.9 milliseconds peak to peak. Wavelength is speed divided by frequency. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and thus the higher the note. We call frequencies below the range of human hearing infrasonic. Those are notes that are below 20 hertz. And we call those tones above our human range as ultrasonic. Those are notes that are above 20 kilohertz. We'll talk more about why these limits exist when we get to link six, tonotopicity, as we dive into the middle ear. Children can hear pitches up to 20,000 hertz, but most adults, sadly, can only hear pitches up to about 16,000 hertz because our ability to hear those higher frequencies 
degrades with time. Dogs, on the other hand, can hear pitches up to 40,000 hertz. And dolphins and whales can actually hear pitches up to 175,000 hertz. One of the skills most critical to our survival from an evolutionary perspective is speech. Human speech occurs most frequently in the 2 kilohertz to 5 kilohertz range. Not surprisingly, we hear pitches that fall into this range as louder and pitches that fall outside this range as less loud. And again, in order to survive, our brain has learned to listen for changes in sound. For instance, we hear quiet noises clearly, but any subsequent increase in amplitude has progressively less effect. Held notes diminish according to the rule of diminishing intensity of continuous stimuli, similar to how a bad smell starts to disappear the longer you're smelling it. Your brain is looking for changes in sound, new information, and de-emphasizes continuous tones. Also, our minds tend to pull extremely high pitches down and extremely low pitches up. It's possible that from a psychoacoustics perspective, our brain is trying to pull everything that it hears to closer within the range of human speech, not only its best talent to analyze, but also the frequency that we think perhaps is most critical to our survival. We'll learn more about this when we learn about the overtone series and why it's physically and mathematically impossible to tune a piano. So we'll get there in a moment. Bear with me. And because phase and interference affect loudness more than amplitude, from the perspective of human perception, when we start putting these notes together in a way that complement each other, we have constructive interference, which makes the tone seem louder to us, even though the actual amplitude of the sound may not have changed at all. By contrast, destructive interference causes sounds to disappear. This is how noise-canceling headphones work. These facts are part of a discipline called psychoacoustics, which we will talk about in great depth in Link 9, The Brain. You may have noticed that some drums produce a tone, such as toms or timpani. Other drums do not, such as a bass drum. In the case of the bass drum, as an example, the two skins on either side of the drum cannot agree on a common frequency of vibration because inconsistent structure results in inconsistent vibration. Because of this, the sound doesn't sustain, and instead it dies out quickly and results in something we hear as a thud. Pitch follows a natural logarithmic scale. Every time we double the frequency, we hear that as the same note an octave higher. We'll talk about octaves in a minute. This means we hear the relationship between two separate tones, whether played in sequence in a melody or played together as a chord, based on the ratio of one tone to another. The lower the numerator and denominator in the ratio and the simpler the ratio, the more consonant they sound to us. The higher and more complex the ratios, the more dissonant they sound to us. Thus, harmony and discord, consonants and dissonance, are not, then, arbitrary, but rather follow a natural logarithmic scale with mathematical precision. This logarithm has driven the evolution of the human inner ear, which is why it is so important in terms of how we perceive sound. We will talk about this when we get to link six, tonotopicity. Say that three times fast. Also, make a wild guess as to how many takes of this video I had to do before I successfully said tonotopicity. It's kind of like a tongue twister. I had one of these in Spanish, right? There's a volcano that's named Parangaricutirimicuaro. Uh, 
and then there's a tongue twister that goes with it. I won't bore you. We can actually hear as small as a one one thousandth difference in pitch. And notice I used another ratio. The octave is the strongest of the ratios because it's two to one. So to go down an octave and find the same note, we take the frequency, we cut it in half. So if the frequency of uh, A is 440 hertz, the A below that is 220, the A below that is 110, the A below that is 55, and the lowest note on the piano, the lowest A is 27.5, which is 55 cut in half. In similar fashion, if we start with 440, what do you imagine then is the next octave above that? If we have an A that's an octave above that, it's 880 hertz, and so on. Now we said that the octave is the strongest of the ratios, two to one. The perfect fifth is the second strongest, three to two. This perfect fifth is actually the basis of the dominant tonic relationship, which is the foundation of the diatonic scale, and hence all of Western music itself. It is also the strongest sound when you go down the scale. In fact, it is the basis for our circle of fifths, which gives us our diatonic 12-note scale and also determines the relationships between each of the keys, major key, minor key, and between each of the notes. So, if you start with a note towards the bottom of the piano and then you play a note a fifth above that one and then a fifth above that and a fifth above that and so on, by the time you get to the 12th note, you'll be back to the same note, although octaves higher. So now let's rearrange all the notes we found and put them in order. And let's shift them all so that they're within the same octave. How do we do that? Remember I said if you want to move an octave down, you cut it in half. So we'll cut some of those upper frequencies in half until they all fit within the same octave. And now you have the 12 notes of our diatonic scale. Chromatic scale. The notes deriving naturally from the harmonic series will work in only one key at a time. What's in tune in one key is likely to be out of tune in another. In fact, if the piano were to encompass only natural untempered tones, a single octave would have to contain 665 keys. And even then, it still wouldn't work out mathematically correctly as the octaves would continue to get wider and wider. Now, obviously, this is not very practical. At some point, something had to give for music to soar the heights of which it is capable. And so in the 17th century, along came Flemish Simon Steven with his equal temperament. In this system, we preserve the octave, the thing that we most readily recognize and the first overtone in the series, the most dominant relationship. We preserve that and then we nudge the 12 tones subdividing that octave around until each one of them is evenly spaced. The result, each half step becomes the 12th root of two to one apart, about 1.059 to one. This represents the frequency ratio of a semitone in the 12 note diatonic scale. This allowed composers to modulate from one key to another freely you don't have to remain in one key from the beginning to the ending of the piece as you did with the Pythagorean and mean tone tuning methods. We'll talk more about those in a moment, but it gives us quite a bit of freedom in music. That's why equal temperament is used universally in music today and consists of a number of small compromises in each of the intervals. However, these compromises are so small that we don't hear them as dissonant. In fact, the human ear is so used to hearing that tuning system today that if we were to hear the perfect ratios, it would sound wrong to us. Now, if I take just the first five overtones and make them into a scale, I have something interesting already. Since the fifth overtone is in between, uh, let's say in the key of C, it's in between the A and the B flat on the piano, I can choose either the higher note, the B flat, or the lower note, the A. It's more common in musical cultures to use the higher note than the lower note, so let's go ahead and do that. Now we have what we call the pentatonic five note scale. 
which is used in many musical cultures around the world, most particularly Asian and Middle Eastern, but also in African music, in various other music around the world. We also have pentatonic scales that are very useful and very common in jazz music. We may have learned this as our first piece. So remember when they told you if you ball up your fist like this and then you find the three black notes on the piano and then you play them like this and then play the note above it and then play them again and play the note below it, you were actually playing in a pentatonic scale. So that is musical tones. Next is linked to overtones. We'll talk about the harmonic series in nature and how it relates to music. Once again, thank you for watching the video. Hope to see you in the next video. Remember to like and subscribe. Thank you.